Uh, before we start the class today, I just want to tell you, thank you for your patience and me not being here. I did have a really exciting, as you know, I did two things. One, I took care of my parents, and I'm still taking care of my parents. But uh, I also was in Israel for a week, and it was a really exciting trip with other Hillel directors. I've been to Israel many times, but on this trip, I got to do a few things that I would never have dreamt I would be able to do. And one was that I uh, met Natan Sharansky in the offices of the uh, Jewish Agency, sitting in the, the conference room there, which was is a historical conference room that many decisions about Israel had been made in. I was just sitting in that room was very exciting. And then I was asked to introduce Natan Sharansky to our group uh, because I have, I, I, I think probably because I was one of the older people in the, in the group. And I remember the days of, you know, our uh, struggles to build the artillery here in the United States. And when I was a teenager in the youth movement, uh, we worked and marched on Washington, and we had the bracelets that twinned us with Soviet uh, partners in, uh, in Russia for our bar and bat mitzvahs. And I, I, I was thrilled to be able to speak about that and introduce Natan Sharansky in the historic conference room of the Jewish Agency. That was really awesome. You spoke I in so, Hebrew? I, I, well, our group was all English speakers, mostly, so I spoke in English. I did brush up on my Hebrew pretty well while I was there during the week. It comes right back to you when you're when you're in the environment. Um, and then uh, the other thing, really cool thing, I did a lot of cool things, but we um, we got to meet Shimon Peres, who is the immediate past president of Israel, in a very intimate setting. Um, like our presidents here have presidential libraries, Shimon Peres has built a place called the Peres Center for Peace. It's in Jaffa, which is outside of Tel Aviv, and his, his whole goal, it's a library, but also a peace institute with trying to come up with ways that we can have a more peaceful world. And we sat in a circle with the president, and it was so, you know, such a, um, a fantastic opportunity, you know, I mean, it was just really neat. So I had a great trip in Israel, and now back and back to work and uh, lots to do here in Staten Island. So. How would you compare that to uh, teaching our class? Well, teaching this <laughs> class is absolutely much better. <laughs> Not uh, as famous, but much better. <laughs> anyway, so in keeping along with David, you know, when David said, when I, we spoke before I left and I told him what I did, and he said, well, do you mind if I talk about entertainers? I said, I think people will love that because I'm very, serious a lot of the time, uh, heavy topics. So I I came back, and who was on the, um, who was featured this past week at the Grammys, and on the front page of AARP Magazine. I admit, I get AARP Magazine. <laughs> Actually, my husband gets it, because he's a little bit of a But anybody get it and see who was on this month's cover? It came last week, so you would have got it. All right. A very, a very um, iconic Jewish figure who also was honored at the Grammys named Robert Zimmerman. Hebrew Bob name. Bob Dylan. Hebrew name. Anybody know his Hebrew name? Shabbatai Zissel. Zizel, I guess you'd say. Shabtai Zizel. Shabtai Zizel ben Abraham. And Shabtai Zizel, I'm going to call him Shabtai Zizel for a while, because I think that's a great name, much better than Bob Dylan, actually. Um, Shabtai Zizel was born in uh, Minnesota to a family that were your very typical American Jewish family. His grandparents came over. His paternal grandparents came over from Odessa in 1902. His maternal grandparents came from Lithuania in 1905. Um, and they made their way to Minnesota. And they were part of a, a very small but close-knit Jewish community in Minnesota. He was raised totally Jewish, keeping kosher, went to Hebrew school. They didn't have yeshiva in their town in Minnesota, was bar mitzvahed, and is a Jew. Uh, Bob Dylan is a Jew, and that Jewish
Jewish identity actually has played an incredibly important influence on his music and on his life. So he started out in 1960, he left home to go to the University of Minnesota for college, and he lasted one year in college. He dropped out after the first year, and uh, he always, he, as a young boy, he was always writing, trying to write songs and playing the guitar. And he dropped out of college, and where does he come? New York. New York. He got a bus ticket, and he come to New York with his guitar on his back, and he goes to Greenwich Village, which was the hip happening scene, and he starts playing for nothing in the, in the, in the nightclubs and coffee houses and on the street corners. And at first he played other people's music, mixed in with some of his own, and, if, and as we all, if you all recall, Bob Dylan's voice is very unique. It's a different kind of a voice. And um, somehow though, his style, his music, got the attention of the uh, music industry people. And before long, he was in the studios making records in the genre of folk music. The other thing that he did when he came to New York, one of the first things he did was he went upstate to visit Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie was in, a, in, a, in an institution um, for he had Parkinson's disease, I think. It was some Huntington's disease. Thank you. He had, so he was in an, uh, an institution of Huntington's and Parkinson's, if I'm not mistaken, are very closely related neurological diseases. Is that? Yeah, it's they a neurological. They're both neurological. But they're both neurological. They have to do with your brain function. And so he was in a, a psychiatric hospital, uh, not because he was uh, insane, but because he had Huntington's disease. And he was Bob Dylan's guru. Uh, Bob Dylan would go and sit and visit with Woody Guthrie on a regular basis. And along with Woody Guthrie, um, Woody Guthrie had, a, uh, had an acolyte called, uh, I got his name is Elliot, but I got to just, he had like a little nickname, Ramblin' Jack Elliot. And Ramblin' Jack Elliot and Woody Guthrie had written a lot of folk music together, which they had gotten from really the uh, Americana roots of Lead Belly and the South and the, out in the West, and they, they really had developed this Woody Guthrie's music, this whole genre. And if you listen to Woody Guthrie, you can hear when, and then listen to Bob Dylan, you can definitely hear those influences in Bob Dylan's music. So, how does a Jewish boy from Minnesota, who comes to New York, end up uh, being a folk music icon? First of all, his music, like I said before, was greatly uh, inspired by Jewish texts and Jewish sources. <laughs> The first song that really was a big hit was a song called Blowin' in the Wind. Oh. Oh. My friend is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Listen, nobody can play that harmonica like that. This reminds me of camp. <laughs> Before it is washed to the sea. Yes, and how many years can two people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times must a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is blowing.
Brought to you by the JCC Chorus. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's like 1963. And he writes that, which is coming right, coming right into the what's going on in, in the United States. But what is Bob Dylan's orientation? He he was a proponent and very active in the civil rights movement, but he also was coming at this from a Jewish sensibility and from having family that perished very recently in the Holocaust, and from 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 feeling a kinship with the African American community because of also Jewish struggles throughout history. So Bob Dylan gets very involved in the civil rights movement. He feels it's his responsibility. And then comes along next song that's very, very famous. Want to sing this one? Yeah. Okay. Admit right. that the waters around you have grown Accepted that soon you'll be dredged to the bone If your time to you is worth saving Better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are changing I'm writers and critics who prophesize with your pen. Keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, but the wheel's still in spin. And I just don't tell the moon that it's taken. For the loser now, you might be later to win. For the times, they are changing. And there's time to spend peace with the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hole, for he that gets hurt will be he who has stole. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls, but the times they are changing. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land. And don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't win your hand. For the times, they are changing. The light is drawn and the curse is cast. The slow one down will later be fast. The order is rapidly fading. First one now will later be last. For the times they are changing. Love that that harmonica and guitar. <coughs> in the uh, Old Testament. Here is a verse from Isaiah. many peoples that roar like the roaring of the seas and the rushing of nations that rush like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but he shall rebuke them and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind 
and like the whirling dust before the, the storm. And it goes on, you know, at eventide, behold the terror. Bob Dylan was greatly, greatly influenced by the prophets, by the writings of the prophets. <coughs> and there are many who consider him to be a modern day prophet. So what is a prophet? Somebody who sees the future, you're, at, you're right. So I want to just share with you what God, Abraham Joshua Heschel a says about a prophet. a prophet. Right. A wise man. Exactly. So what Abraham Joshua Heschel says is, is that, above all, prophets remind us of the moral state of a people. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. If we admit that the individual is in some measure conditioned or affected by the spirit of society, an individual's crime discloses society's corruption. In a community not indifferent to suffering, uncompromisingly impatient with cruelty and falsehood, continually concerned for God and for every man, crime would be infrequent rather than common. So to the person endowed with prophetic sight, everyone else appears blind. To a person whose ear perceives God's voice, everyone else appears deaf. No one is just, no knowing is strong enough, no trust complete enough. The prophet hates the approximate, he shuns the middle of the road. Man must live on the summit to avoid the abyss. The, carried away by the challenge, the demand to straighten out man's ways, the prophet is strange and one-sided and a variable extremist. And if you read the prophets, in the Bible, they're scary. They're always doomed, you know, it, it, for the most part. They're doomed, you know, doomsday sayers. And particularly Isaiah, who is thought that his prophecies, in particular, they foretell, and I'm saying that in the present, the end of the world, the end of days. So Bob Dylan wrote about the times he lived in because a prophet's, uh, also according to Heschel, a prophet's words have to be contemporary in modern times and the times of the prophet, but using what is going on in the sociological milieu in order to preach and write it back and warn the people. It's thought that prophets actually are appointed by God, that God you know, speaks to prophets or reveals to them things to share with everyone else, and everyone else usually thinks that prophets are kooks. And in the days of the biblical prophets, people thought they were kooks too. Nobody listened to them. You know, Jeremiah would, would wander around making these big speeches, and Isaiah, uh, you know, on the street corner, the end is near, and everybody was like, keep away from me, you're a nut. <laughs> Bob Dylan, in his heart, and you can read this in his autobiography, he truly felt called as a prophet. And so his writing and his music and his songs were coming out from that place, from a place of feeling he had a responsibility because of his unique individual personal relationship with God to share with the rest of the world, to point out what was going wrong, what was the matter, and what needed to be done to set things right. Did he say you read his book, I didn't even know he had one. Did he say he was following? Well, he doesn't have his autobiography, he has a biography. Well, he, he has some, it's a somewhat of a, but he has, a, it's a, more of a biography written by, I have the name of the author. Also. And it said he oh, actually so actively read and followed Isaiah? I don't know if he actively read and followed Isaiah, but he knew of Isaiah, he knew of the prophets, he was educated in, you know, in Jewish texts and Jewish sources. He was not an observant Jew. By any stretch, he, you know, he lived his life and did what he wanted to do. He did not follow the laws of Judaism um, as an adult at all. But he, he felt personally called to be a prophet. That's what I'm trying to say, uh, and specifically a prophet for America, for the United States of America. He thought things were going wrong. Remember, it's the middle of the civil rights movement. He wanted yeah, to make yeah. a statement. He felt called to, you know, to do this. And throughout his life, as he wrote his music, 
He wrote, you know, different music with different kinds of uh, messages. At one point, he uh, he started to study Christianity, and he converted to Christianity. Mm -hmm. He um, got involved with an evangelical church, and he he became for a short while a Christian. And he wrote a whole album uh, that was based on that conversion to Christianity. And in that album, actually, as a, the album was highly critiqued, but he, and his response to the critique was, well, everybody says I'm a prophet, because people called him a prophet even back then. And when I tell them that Jesus is the answer, they don't listen to me. The truth is, is you know, he wrote some beautiful songs, beautiful lyrics. The name of that album is A Slow Train Coming. Slow Train Coming, if you want to look it up. Many of the songs in that album are biblical references. It's really, he only, he, he, he did not remain a Christian for very long, in truth. He visited Israel many times. And he had gone to Israel actually as a young man in the 60s. There's a very famous picture of him praying at the, at the wall. And he went back to Israel and he ended up, when he did finally marry and settle down, he raised his family and his children as Jews. They all were bar mitzvah. He actually is, to this day, extremely involved in, uh, in his local Chabad in Los Angeles. That's where he belongs to uh, synagogue. And he performed uh, a few times on the Chabad um, telephone. So, but he did have kind of a flirtation with Christianity and actually went through a, a conversion. The, 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 the reason is, is he was, a, he is, because he's still alive. I should not speak of him in the past tense. He just was on the Grammys. He is a spiritual person, and he takes his music um, as very seriously as one, one way to get messages across to people about the state of the world. And obviously his heyday was in the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, throughout the 80s and 90s, he still was writing music. He has never stopped being on tour, except for one time when he just kind of got very fed up back in the late 60s, early 70s, and he had a motorcycle accident, and he took eight years before he got back into uh, performing. But even during those eight years, he wrote music, which has now come up as something in an album that's called The Basement Tapes, which was published many years ago, but that he wrote back then. So um, let's go to our next song. This one is from that album that I just told you about, which is called The Slow Train Coming. Did he come out with a Christmas album? This is, <laughs> I think he did have a Christmas album, actually. That's where I converted. One time I heard a comedian in a nightclub who was very funny. He did a riff on Bob Dylan's Bar Mitzvah. And he like did the Haftor in a Bob Dylan-esque manner. It was very funny. So this one's called The Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall, and this is from that Slow Trains Are Coming album, the, the album when he was a Christian. Okay. So what does it mean when you're asking somebody, where have you been? Where are you? <coughs> they're missing, right? It's easy, like they're missing. Where were you? You were gone for so long. But the blue-eyed son and my darling young one, the, the, the people who... Uh, dissect Bob Dylan's music, analyzes music, feel that this is talking about Jesus. <coughs> and that, um, that it, it's making reference to that Jesus is not, uh, you know, has not been present in the world, stumbling, crawling, uh, crooked, sad, <coughs> dead oceans, frozen. It's kind of foretelling a, a word, it's talking about a world without without Jesus in it. So all through his life, he struggled with issues of spirituality, transforming them into, into music. And his songs, I, would, I think it's fair to say, became ballads of the civil rights movement back in, in his early music, Blowing in the Wind, Times They Are Changing. And this one, uh, having to do with, you know, this is not as well known, but. Then there's one that is um, pretty well known. 
They, and they were all, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, actually, it's, it, I should say that um, many artists, they were close with each other, but many of them also did covers of each other's songs. And a lot of Bob Dylan's music was done on, you know, by cover by a lot of other musicians. Let's see if we can get this one. So he had his ups and downs in life and his transformations. And this next one is about a time when he was feeling low about the state of the, of the world. It's a, I'm sure you all know the song. Which one is this? What's the one that I'm on heaven's door. So knocking on heaven's door. <coughs> Is talking about if you read the lyric, it's it's a song of the prophet. It's a song of the prophet who can't see anymore. You see what the lyric says? I take this badge off of me. The badge refers to the assignation of being someone who you know of, who, ha, who can connect. Uh, as a prophet with God's message. I can't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's getting dark, too dark for me to see. I feel like I'm knocking on heaven's door, which that the communication, people think it's like, well, I'm dying, that's so I'm knocking on heaven's door, but it was really, um, he felt blocked that he, you know, he wasn't uh, connecting anymore. So you're saying he's knocking on heaven's door to try to get the message back. Right, to try to get the message back. So that's Bob Dylan's yeah. interpretation right, or Shaktai Zissel. Well, it sounds Shabtai like you're dying. Zissel. But you know, music, you can always interpret in lots and lots of different ways. You know, then the next lyric I gave you also Thank has you. to, is Gotta Serve Somebody. <coughs> this was his, his real mm -hmm. Christian anthem that um, you gotta serve somebody. It, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. You might be a rock and roll addict prancing on the stage. You might have drugs at your command, women in a cage. And by the way, with knocking on heaven's door, I, I, I meant to say, he also went through, like <coughs> all musicians at the time, of serious drug so, issues yeah. and uh, getting involved in drugs. And So this one, Gotta Serve Somebody, is particularly about, is about Jesus, might as well be the Lord. And then, this next one, I never knew about this song until I started researching for this class. It's on an album of his called The Infidel, Infidels. And Infidels, like Slow Train of Coming in his, is his Christian album, Infidels is his Zionist album. In, in this song and in other songs on the Infidel uh, record, it, he's talking about Israel, specifically <coughs> Israel and the Jewish people. Um, so let me start with uh, with reading. Does anybody else want to read besides me? Yeah, it's called Neighborhood Bully. Let me get the end. Oh, I've got to read loud. Well, the neighborhood bully, he's just one man. His enemies say he's on their land. They got him outnumbered about a million to one got no place to escape to, no place to run. He's the neighborhood bully. The neighborhood bully just lives to survive. He's criticized and condemned for being alive. He's not supposed to fight back. He's supposed to have thick skin. He's supposed to lay down and die when his door is kicked in. He's the neighborhood bully. The neighborhood bully's been driven out of every land. He's wandered the earth, an exiled man seen his family scattered, his people hounded and torn. He's always on trial for just being born. He's the neighborhood bully. <laughs> well, he knocked out a lynch mob. He was criticized. Old women condemned him, said he should apologize. Then he destroyed a bomb factory. Nobody was glad. The bombs were meant for him. He was supposed to feel bad. He's the neighborhood bully. Well, the chances are against it, and the odds are slim that he'll live by the rules that the world makes for him. Because there's a noose at his neck and a gun at his back, and a license to kill him is given out to every maniac. He's the neighborhood bully. He got no allies to really speak of. 
What he gets, he must pay for. He don't get it out of love. He buys obsolete weapons and he won't be denied, but no one sends flesh and blood to fight by his side. He's a neighborhood bully. Well, he's surrounded by pacifists who all want peace. They pray for it nightly, but the bloodshed must cease. Now they wouldn't hurt a fly. To hurt one, they would weep. They lay and they wait for this bully to fall asleep. He's the neighborhood bully. I've covered him more powerful than anything. Every empire that's enslaved him is gone. Egypt and Rome and even the great Babylon. He's made a garden of paradise in the desert sand in bed with nobody under no one's command. He's the neighborhood bully. Now his holiest books have been trampled upon. No contract he signed was worth what it was written on. He took the crumbs of the world and he turned it into wealth. He took sickness and disease and he turned it into health. He's the neighborhood bully. What's anybody indebted to him for? Nothing, they say. He just likes to cause war. Pride and prejudice and superstition indeed. They wait for this bully like a dog waits to feed. He's the neighborhood bully. What has he done to wear so many scars? Does he change the course of rivers? Does he pollute the moon and stars? Neighborhood bully standing on the hill, running out the clock, time standing still. Neighborhood bully. Yeah. So look at what year this was written. Nineteen eighty-three. It's the same thing going on today. You know, things don't change. But I, I actually never knew about this song until I was preparing for this class, and I came across it. I was studying all of his albums, and I thought, wow. I never realized he, you know, he felt that way. And he did, he, and, and subsequently I learned he has visited Israel many times. He took all of his sons, they were bar mitzvahed in Israel at the wall. And he, and his son most recently wrote a, his, one of his sons wrote a song in response to this past summer's war in Gaza about, you know, along the same thing, themes about how Hamas is, you know, glorified, whereas Israel is uh, vilified. vilified. And it's the same, it's the same, I thought that that was really like, wow, feet. So, the good thing you bring that up, the Messiah will come after an age of chutzpah. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, really talks about the, when, the end of days, when the Messiah will come, and how the world, as we know, will come to an end, but it will, it, will bring in the messianic times. So there are a lot of people, it's a very, it's a whole widespread thing going on, phenomenon going on out there that of people looking at the end of days, an apocalyptic, uh, you know, theology, prophecy. There are people, I would, you, you, I, I've been shocked by some of the things. I think there are people who really legitimately believe that this is, we are in the time of, you know, the world that is soon to be the end of days. So like, I, like Isaiah, watch out. Things are going to come to an end and everything's going to um, be destroyed. So that, you know, Bob Dylan was one of those messengers in our modern times who um, didn't necessarily speak about the end of days. I gave you an article here in his mystical Midrash. I'll remember when I told you the definition of Midrash is kind of the back story. He used his music, people think of him as using his music as a form of Midrash. So all like folk tales and legends and art, music and poetry are all the forms of Midrash. So now today, he's still touring and still singing he, uh, the, the article that was in the AARP magazine was an interview with him. He's been on, since after those eight years that he took off, he's been on what he calls the never-ending tour. He never stops. He always keeps going and keeps touring. I think next, I think you can buy tickets for a concert that he's planning uh, in March. He's, if he was born in 1941, how old does that make him? 74. 74. And he's still going strong. Um, and I want to play for you, if I can find it. 
yes. This is his latest album. His latest album is called Shadows in the Night. And um, listen, listen to, and this album, Shadows in the Night, is about aging and about getting older in the world and, you know, starting to think about your, you know, be facing with your own mortality and how you're going to live the rest of your life to, to its best ability. And so this is, uh, this is the, one of the songs in that. I think it's a great song. <laughs> Listen to this as compared with blowing in the wind. Almost there. <laughs> Sad. It's a dirge, yeah. and, and in the That's end, he dirt. says, you know, though I stumble, I pray, every path leads to thee, all I can do is pray, stay with me. So even today, his last album, he's seeking and trying to build a relationship with God. So he, he was a, a, he's a very spiritual person, and I think that his music, I mean, we all knew his songs, Blowing in the Wind, and times they are changing. They were things that, you know, did help make the world change to be a better place. And um, I just lost the train of thought. <laughs> I need to stay with me. But so there were things that did help to make the world a better place. And an icon of our times with uh, his music. So thank you. That's a little bit about Shabtai Zisel and Abraham. Well, I made a bridge. <laughs> I made a bridge from entertainment to the prophets. <laughs> thank you.